Shooting games have been around since the dawn of gaming and are some of the most popular games out there, for better or worse. They screenshot well, are easy to market, and it's a concept that translates easily into fast-paced and competitive systems that are popular with players. However, although we often associate the genre with inherent violence, there is one game that takes the rail shooter and turns it into an outlet of creativity rather than destruction. Pokemon Snap, released in 1999 for the Nintendo 64, takes the gun out of our hands and replaces it with a camera. There was no other game like it. No other titles used photography this way. In the US. But what seemed like a totally unique concept to us was actually part of a short-lived trend of games in Japan in the 90s and early 2000s based around photography that used the concept of shooting in the exact same way. Snap was, of course, mostly responsible for this trend taking off, but it was not actually the first example of a game with this mechanic set released. Before we get into today's topic though, I just wanted to give you all a final reminder to pick up a Tama plush if you haven't already. There's only a few days left on the campaign to get the limited edition Tama plush funded, and although it's a long shot, if a lot of you decide to buy it right now, it can still get made. If not, everyone gets their money back, but I just figured I'd do whatever I can to get word out about it. At least I can say I tried. Although there are plenty of games released in Japan that mostly remain undocumented on the internet in English, so I could be wrong and there could be an even earlier example, as far as I can tell, the earliest iteration of this concept is Gekibo Gekisha Boy, released for the PC Engine in 1992 and developed by Tomcat System. This game is an original story that centers around David, an American amateur photographer who goes to a photography school in LA. Surprisingly, though the gameplay is pretty simple in Arcadian format, the content of the game itself goes out of its way to be really abrasive and mean-spirited. Like Comprehensible in the way it portrays people who live in LA for a game made in 1992, the same year as the LA riots. It is also claimed by some to be the very first use of the F-word ever in a video game. It's not like, teehee, this is so edgy and off-color, how cheeky! It's more like, oh my god, why did they ruin these creative mechanics with this awful, unfunny, and racist framing? Also not for nothing, but I think that there should be a bare minimum expectation of a game about photography to not portray its subjects in the most unflattering light possible. So this game is a 2D auto-scroller, and it uses the shooting mechanic much like Snap. Your film is ammo, your gun is a camera, and you crawl through the predetermined courses trying to take photos of all the weird things you see. The Dean will tell you at the start of the level the amount of points you need and one specific shot you need to get to pass. If you aim and time your shots correctly to get each set piece at the optimal time, you get more points. The weirder the scenery, the more points it's worth. You also have to try to dodge things on the ground like skateboards or balls, and if you take photos of things that come at you, it destroys them and protects you from getting hit. Your camera can also do things like pop balloons or crash zeppelins in the background, so it does still behave a little bit more like a traditional shooter than a full-on photography game. If you get hit, you lose film, which means that you lose out on potential points at the end of the level for the amount of film remaining, since the Dean wants you to not waste any. Once per level, the exact thing you've been told to get a picture of will show up, and you either pass or fail based on whether you snap a picture of it or not, and meet the required point total. Really, it's like a proto-snap. Almost all of the same mechanical elements are there. The main difference is that your Dean does not grade you on the quality of your photos, they're just instantly translated into point values determined upon taking the picture, and there are a few more arcadey elements to make it more similar to a typical rail shooter. I don't think that necessarily Necessarily, this game inspired Pokemon Snap directly, as there was a good three years between its release in 1992 and the beginning of Pokemon Snap's development in 1995 as the early working title Jack and the Beanstalk before it gained the Pokemon license and treatment. It's possible that the developers of Snap were aware of it and drew some inspiration from it, or it could be a complete parallel thinking move, where they just came up with the exact same concept independently. It's not too much of a stretch to believe that two different development teams would settle on the same set of mechanics for a similar concept. However, even if this game was some sort of direct relative of Snap, I really don't recommend checking it out. The main thing to take away from it existing is just that there's a precedent for this sort of thing that existed before Snap. Snap itself came out in 1999 at the height of Pokemania. Much like a dark ride at an amusement park, the player's vehicle auto-scrolls through set courses where Pokemon roam free and strike poses on a predetermined and pre-timed animation loop. You're given a few tools throughout the game to disrupt these loops in interesting ways and interact with the environment in order to get a wider variety of subjects to take photos of, which is similar to the way that the camera could interact with some things in the environment in Gekibo. There are seven courses, and the player must return to these courses multiple times throughout the game as they unlock more helpful items in order to see and photograph all 63 of the Pokemon available in the game, as well as find secrets hidden in each stage to either complete the Pokemon Science Report or unlock another new level. Rather than there being any obstacles on the track, the car is self-steering and self-paced, and instead you're just given a set of 60 frames and the course ends when you either run out or reach the end. With the booster upgrade later in the game, you can run into and get stopped by Pokemon crossing the track, but you don't lose any film or take any kind of penalty 
penalty for this, and in fact can get some unique shots this way. You don't earn any extra points for unused film. So the main goal of each level is just to get as many shots of as many different things as possible and not use up all your film too fast in order to make it to the photo opportunities later in the level. Once you return to Professor Oak's lab at the end of each stage, you select your best shots to show him and can choose one of each Pokemon photograph. Then Professor Oak will grade each individual subject based on a few factors, like the size of the Pokemon compared to the frame, where in each frame the subject is placed, whether the subject is facing the camera, and so on and so forth. Of course, the real photographs are often made more interesting by things like the subject being partially obscured or off to the side of the frame, Oak is very scientific and wants things dead center, unobscured, and clearly visible in frame. And he'll give you more points if there are more of the same Pokemon in the shot, or if he recognizes a specific secret set piece in the level. Any artsy photographs are best saved for your personal album, because Oak will not appreciate them and you'll end up throwing them away. It's a pity that there are so many unique Pikachu scenes in this game, and some are inherently worth more than others, so you can go to a lot of trouble to get the balloon Pikachu at all, but it still won't beat your Pikachus on logs from the first stage by nature of there being only one Pokemon in the frame. Still, this is a feature pretty unique to Pokemon Snap, since no other games in this genre will grade you on the quality of photos in the same way. Most have a pass-fail system, where you either get the shot at all or you don't. I think this adds a significant amount of replayability to the game, since players are encouraged to continue to come back and try to beat their own high scores for each stage or get better photos of each Pokemon. There's also an element of problem solving here that isn't found in other similar games. Part of the gameplay is looking for ways to interact with the level using the tools that you have and figuring out how to set up unique sequences in the stage. What amazes me about Snap is that I've been playing for like 20 years now, and I'm still finding secrets in this game I didn't know about every time I replay it. Though the game does not necessarily reward creativity in the actual photography, it does reward creativity in problem solving, making it one of the more creative focused photo games out there. One of the key points of appeal for Snap was just getting to see Pokemon in their natural habitats and see their lives and habits explored in a way that the main series games couldn't provide, as well as the novelty of getting to see your favorite buddies in 3D in an era where that was still a rare treat. Their movements and behaviors were so well animated and very realistic, it felt like a new way to exist in the Pokemon world. Although the ethics of going into a Pokemon's natural habitat and pelting them with gas to make them intentionally angry is questionable at best. The success of Pokemon Snap as a photography game hinged entirely on our previous investment in the character and their world, and the excitement of getting to take photographs and then print them out as stickers at the local blockbuster. However, that didn't hold Snap back from exploring the concept of photography in a creative and fun way, and innovate in ways that no other games in the genre would emulate. At the time, there was just no demand for a photography game, so it's interesting that they pursued this concept for a game that they knew would be released outside of Japan, where Gekibo had already had some success. Ultimately, it paved the way for many games after it to explore the photography concept in interesting ways and put their own spin on it. One such game that takes the snap formula and adds a new twist is Cardcaptor Sakura Tomoyo no Video Daisaksen, released on the Dreamcast in 2000 and developed by Sega AM3. Cardcaptor Sakura is an anime that was localized in the US as Cardcaptors in 2000. It had a lot of similarities with Pokemon in that it shared elementary school age protagonists and a monster of the day episodic format, but it failed to take off quite as well here. The original anime in Japan was a shoujo with a female protagonist and appealed mostly to a female audience, whereas the dub tried to change the tone and focus of the show to include include Lee as a main character and appeal more to a gender-neutral demographic, and take advantage of the set that was already interested in shows like Pokemon, to mild success. The reason I mention this is that if you grew up watching the dub card captors, you may be surprised to see that most of the games released based on this property focused entirely on Sakura, or in this case, her best friend Tomoyo. The original show is now available on Netflix and I really recommend checking it out since it's one of my favorite anime ever. But I digress. Tomoyo was a vlogger way ahead of her time and followed Sakura around filming her adventures, which is the premise of this game. Tomoyo no video dice and translates to Tomoyo's video strategy. And rather than taking photos, this game has you recording live video. Kind of. Each level is made up of in-engine live 3D animated videos of parts of episodes of the show. And rather than running through them in a vehicle that's set in one place on a track, instead you control the camera and revolve around the action as it makes its way through the level. This is kind of hilarious if you consider the premise. You're supposed to be Tomoyo running around getting footage of what's happening to Sakura, but it's actually impossible for that to be the case because Sakura is almost always moving at high speed in each of these scenes in a way that Tomoyo could not possibly follow on foot and get these dynamic angles of. Tomoyo also also talks to you as if you're a participant getting video for her, so perhaps the player is a new character in this scenario, but either way, without magic, no human could get these shots. This is also a logical leap the anime itself takes and jokes around with, so I guess I can't complain too much about them carrying it over in an adaptation. Caro is also in each scene while simultaneously acting as director for your cinematography, and there's so much shouting happening from characters in the scene and characters giving you directions or reacting to you that it's actually kind of overwhelming how many voices are always yelling. <laughs> Why?
Each level has a handful of shots that you need to achieve, predetermined by the game. These shots never change and can be memorized, but higher difficulties add a higher volume of shots, and you can change things like whether you receive instructions for each shot to make it even harder. Carol will verbally shout directions for you to control the cinematography, which also appear on screen as written commands. You need to follow his instructions within a set time limit for each shot to succeed, and if you fail, Tomoyo gets more and more upset. If you fail when Tomoyo is at blue health, you fail the level and need to restart. This includes secret shots, which Caro doesn't give you instructions for unless you succeed on the previous shot within a few seconds. Rather than directions like from behind and zoomed in, the secret shots will be things like make sure to get all the characters in the frame or zoom in on me. Despite being called secrets, these shots are not optional and will count as a mark against you if you miss them. You only pass the level if you get enough shots to survive and finish with health left. At the end of each level, Caro evaluates how well you managed to follow his instructions, but again, this is more of a pass-fail than any real critique. If you manage to get the secret shots, Carol will remark on the subjects of each one, like Sakura's clothes, how cool he looks in the video, and so on and so forth. And if it's your first time managing to successfully shoot a secret, you'll unlock an extra in Tomoyo's room. Although Carol seems to only examine some really awful-looking still frames, the game does allow you to save a recording of your cinematography to the VMU. You can watch the entire scene back in the video theater menu in this eerie void with no sound or music, and trade files with friends by having them plug in another controller with their own VMU inserted. So it is videos as opposed to photos, but it also isn't. You move the camera around a live scene and the game will save your movements and let you watch them back, but the game actually only really scores you on still frames. Did you manage to get the still frame during the allotted time or not? Yes or no? Although this game thematically shares some things in common with Snap and conceptually is similar, the mechanics play a lot more like a classic FMV game, just in 3D with the camera physically moving around the environment based on your inputs. It's a neat little spin on the concept, but ultimately is a little clunky in execution. There are only three main levels and one bonus special level you can unlock when you beat the game, and the goal is to get you to play through the same three main levels a few times in order to unlock all the extras in Tomoyo's room, which include 3D models of characters and cloud cards with backstory, costumes, music, additional videos which are mostly AMVs of the show set to music from the show, and one minigame which unfortunately my totally legitimate copy of the game crashes on opening. It works as a decent incentive to replay a few times, but unfortunately the rewards themselves are a little shallow. Still, it's interesting to see the game try and do something a little different with the concept of photography, and it makes for a fun afternoon of gaming. It is, however, not super friendly to non-Japanese speakers, as it requires you to be able to read, listen, and understand Karo's Osaka-ben, and it doesn't use any kanji which can make it hard to immediately intuit the meaning of what's on screen. The text also for some reason auto-scrolls on a time limit, so if you're slow at reading, you're kind of SOL. There are many other entries in the genre that we don't have time to cover today, but I should quickly mention to illustrate the scope of this trend. In 2001, Fatal Frame was released, a full-on horror game that revolved around photography that is just way too much to talk about for today's video. And there are a few more obscure Snap-alike games like Food Aiki, a game that has you take a road trip through a Google Maps Street View-esque layout of rural Japan taking photos of the scenery. In 2002, Gekibo was re-released on the PlayStation, and there was a planned and cancelled sequel called Polaroid Pete for the PlayStation 2. There is also a 1994 game called Africa that had you taking photos of an African safari that was remade for the PlayStation in 2009. There there are many more games after this point that took the concept of photography and integrated it into other kinds of gameplay. For example, Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, released in 2001, has the pictograph contest. And as time went on, more and more games that had nothing at all to do with photography would start including in-game camera features. However, full games focusing entirely on photography were much more rare, and the trend only continued for a couple more years. Pokemon Snap 2 is on the horizon amid a slowly growing boom in photography in modern games used as a social marketing or social play feature. Snap 1 may have been kind of strangely both ahead of and still firmly a product of its time, but Snap 2 makes perfect sense in the modern landscape of games and social media blending together. I wonder if this new game will take the photography concept a little further and experiment with other elements, like lighting or photo editing. Now that we've evolved past arcade-style gameplay, and games can accomplish these concepts in more depth. I suppose that remains to be seen, but I have hope that a game released in 2020 about photography might have even more depth than we got in 1999.